In this program, you'll see professional magicians and performers who, after years of practice, are able to accomplish tricks and illusions which appear to be and are extremely dangerous. Please do not try to copy any of these tricks you will see. For centuries, magic has amazed and horrified audiences with dangerous illusions. Countless lovely assistants have been mutilated, sawn and beheaded in the name of entertainment. One of the oldest death-defying tricks is the Indian sword basket illusion. A girl is placed in a flimsy wicker basket and then swords and spears are thrust through it. Danger, or implied danger, is a powerful attraction for those in search of a vicarious thrill. Magicians have always happily given the public what they want, and in the process, they explore primal fears within us all. This is danger that is ultimately safe. I see this, and yet I know deep down everything is really safe. The magician isn't putting the sword through the assistant. He's not really sawing her in half. It looks that way. And there might be stage blood all over the stage. But in magic, things are not always what they seem. Nothing fills us with the joy of life like the fear of death. It feels good to scream. It makes you feel alive. It makes you feel wonderful. Ah! Ah! <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. calm down. Calm, calm down. It's just a little bit of red paint in a squeeze bulb. It's no big deal. Quiet guys scream. It's not a great deal. My partner, Penn, and I have always admired the honeybee. We think it's a beautiful thing uh, for the same reasons that, uh, that you find it in classical literature. You know, I think this is one of the eclogues devoted to, to beekeeping. Uh, the bee is a very lovely kind of animal to have on the planet, and we thought that it would be nice to do something with bees. Uh, and the only plot that we could think of was we thought that we should parody the way magicians uh, vaunt their, their, their power by producing live tigers, by producing 100,000 uh, apparently dangerous animals. Well, you want wild animals? We got wild animals. Tell her, build a tila, ein, zwei, drei, vier, six, seven. Okay. So they're not Bengal tigers, but they are alien, six-legged, hairy monsters capable of injecting your flesh with a deadly poison. Yes, they're bees. Aware that a sting in the eye could cause blindness and that multiple stings could even be deadly, Penn and Teller took every precaution to make this trick safe. So we went to an allergist who incidentally declined to be named in any publicity because he didn't think this was exactly a legitimate thing for an allergist to do. But the allergist tested us for the stings of every kind of stinging insect. Neither of us had a serious allergy to it. I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, yeah, but Sigmund and Leroy putting those little... It's a routine that's genuinely dangerous. And meanwhile, of course, Penn and Teller are deftly performing magic tricks throughout. Let's do a number equal to every tiger Sigmund and Leroy ever produced. There we go. There's for all the ones they produced other times. And what about all the little bunnies and doves and kittens that they ever pulled out of anywhere? I think we've covered Sigmund We have and to Leroy. go step by step with these things. Positions. We began by wearing full beekeeper suits with the hoods, with the full garments, with the thick gloves. And, uh, we got in and got used to the idea of the bees being around us, and we noted their behavior. And their behavior was that they never stung unless they were squished. While we're at it, let's go with Blackstone. You got your, you got your Copperfield, you got your Thurston, you got your Kreskin. I know what you're thinking, Kreskin's a mentalist, but I'm sure he pulled a bunny or two in his life. And besides, this bee right here reads minds at least as well as Kreskin. How about all the amateur magicians? Here's the amount of animals produced by all the amateur magicians. 
conditions in North America. And then we tried it without the beekeeper suits. And then we tried it without the gloves, but we discovered that if we didn't seal around our cuffs, bees would crawl in, and crawling in under the cuff is a, a dangerous sort of thing because the bee can get trapped, panic, and sting you. Ouch! Okay, we got South America, we got, ooh, there's Antarctica. Every animal produced in Antarctica is stinging me, right next to Greenland. And we also got Europe and Africa covered here. Bill's got Europe and Africa on my, Europe and Africa. And what about Australia? We'll put another bee on the Barbie. Now, I can't say that in the heat of performance, we didn't get a few stings. Uh, I, I got one somewhere on my scalp. I think that was about the time that I was dumping a large container, I think a, a top hat full of bees on my head. No, it was a pot. It was a pot of bees that I was dumping on my head. We have one million bees in this. Okay, it's not a million bees, it's more like 100,000 bees. It's still more animals than produced by all the magicians. Okay, now it's a million bees. Sigmund and Leroy, you are wimps. It is your move and say the you know, Penn's very animated, and I think during the course of his, his animation, he got stung some 20 or 24 times, uh, which is not pleasant. Uh, he, my, my favorite of his things, of course, was that he was talking so enthusiastically that one actually flew into his mouth, got trapped, and stung him on the roof of his mouth. Uh, the only reaction he had was that his, well, how shall I say, his... All right, I'll say it. His, his scrotum swelled up, and he very proudly showed it around backstage. There's another kind of animal we want to do, too, and that is a rabbit out of a hat. There's nothing at all scary about a rabbit, is there? Well, how about this rabbit? Ah! I wonder how many children watching tonight are going to be talking about that to a court-appointed psychiatrist. There we have it. The most famous magician of them all, Harry Houdini, earned his place in history as a daredevil performer of extremely dangerous tricks. Neither Houdini nor Penn and Teller ever performed dangerous tricks. When you hear of Houdini escaping from a packing crate that's been, was tossed off a bridge, well, had you actually seen the event, it wasn't tossed off the bridge. It was gingerly and carefully lowered into the water because Houdini left no concern for safety unattended to. You'd be mad to do it. Art is not about real danger. Art's about make-believe. And anyone who allows real danger in art is deeply immoral. In the 70 years since Houdini's death, Many inaccurate and misleading claims have been made about his exploits. Only a few first-person accounts, along with fragments of newsreels and films, can bear witness to the truth behind the Houdini legend. Virtually everything that anyone said or wrote about Houdini, and certainly anything that he said or wrote about himself, needs to be questioned. I think that the vast majority of Houdini's escapes required physical strength, agility, endurance, and athletic ability more than overcoming any real severe element of danger. Properly performed under the predictable plan circumstances he had devised, there was relatively little danger. The gathered crowd was unable to see a safety rope attached to Houdini's ankle. So great were his skills as a showman that not one of the thousands of people below ever suspected that Houdini was in fact in no danger at all. But some tricks were truly dangerous. His Chinese water torture cell escape was the trick in Houdini's show that carried the greatest risk. A reinforced glass box resembling a telephone booth was filled with 250 gallons of water. Houdini, okay. securely fastened by his ankles and handcuffed, would then be lowered headfirst into the water. The torture cell was securely locked and covered. Eyewitness reports claim that Houdini would remain underwater as long as five minutes before escaping and revealing himself to the frenzied audience. Only a handful of modern performers have ever attempted this escape. We decided to do a, a version of Houdini's water torture cell 
so we rehearsed that and, and built the props and, and we taped it. Uh, and it was a very uh, bad idea, I think, to go underwater. Uh, it's not something I would do in my show, in my live show. Uh, I just can't see doing that twice a night. It really was dangerous. I remember when we were taping the trick, when I went under the water and they locked the lid on, the cameras were rolling. I remember thinking to myself, what was I thinking? Why did I ever agree to do this? Okay, Ready, Simon? Yeah. The secret of Houdini's water torture cell is known to only a dozen people in the entire world. American escape artist Bob Fellows is one of the very few performers to present the escape exactly as Houdini did it more than 70 years ago. of decapitation has always featured heavily in magic history, especially in the 19th century. Many magicians realized that a baffling illusion, a splash of stage blood, and some genuine risk to life or limb would guarantee a packed theater. Magicians have long known that in a dark and smoky theater, a horrified audience usually cannot perceive that the severed head is not real. In magic, you don't ask someone to, take a, to look at a stick and pretend it's a sword. In magic, if you see something that looks like a sword on stage, you take that as real, and it's often demonstrated to be real. And when you cut somebody's head off with it, it's, it's quite startling because it looks real. First recorded in ancient Egypt, the decapitation illusion is one of the oldest in the history of magic and is still very popular today. the 16th century book on magic, The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott. Decapitation was originally used to portray biblical stories, like the beheading of John the Baptist. Indeed, it's such a classic that master magician Lance Burton still performs it in his Las Vegas show. It consists of a magician removing someone's head and placing it on a table. The disembodied head is still alive and speaks to the magician and the audience. Okay, let's check in with the patient. Ah, he ain't got nobody! 
Well, at least his singing voice has improved. Sophisticated modern audiences are still entertained by this old illusion, though nowadays it's usually performed as comedy. In the past, magicians embellished decapitation illusions with graphic storylines and grisly methods. Reenactments of human sacrifices led almost inevitably to public execution with guillotine blades. In the 1950s, the dramatic lighting, music, and stage presence of South American magician Ricciardi elevated the decapitation illusion to the cutting edge of the art. Ricciardi was to go on to achieve even greater fame for one of the most famous dangerous illusions in magic history. The classic illusion called Sawing a Woman in Half has been presented in many different forms by many performers. The original version was invented by a British magician called Percy Tibbles, who used the stage name Selbit. Selbit's simple version consisted of sawing through a box with a woman inside it. It was so popular, it was rapidly copied and elaborated on by other magicians, including American Horace Goldin, until it became a true classic of magic. Horace Goldin, a rival of Selbit's, devised a new method of doing the trick, in which the two halves of the box were separated. Throughout the trick, the woman's head and feet were visible, making his version that much more convincing. But the large size of the box blatantly suggested to the audience the methods employed by Goldin. An American illusion designer, Guy Jarrett, criticized Goldin, claiming he'd done more to damage magic than any other individual. Selbit was not discouraged by Goldin's improved version, and he resolved to take the illusion to America. Unfortunately, Goldin got there first and patented the trick. When Selbit arrived in the States, he found that Goldin had sent out several touring companies specifically to perform the sawing illusion. By the early 1920s, numerous rival magicians, franchised by both Goldin and Selbit, were sawing ladies in half all over America. The rivalry between the two men continued and even extended into matters of publicity. Goldin kept ambulances, doctors and nurses in attendance at all his theatres. Selbit countered by employing a man to casually empty a bucket of stage blood into the gutter as the theatre cues watched in horror. This rivalry could easily be misconstrued as blatant copying. Copyright infringement and creative piracy is still a problem that plagues magicians today. Copyism is not any form of compliment. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? No. If someone is copying something that you've developed for your act, they're basically stealing your work. And stealing that is, is no more of a compliment than it is if you came to my house and stole my television. Even worse than magicians stealing ideas from each other was the danger that the public might find out just how the tricks were done. If it ever became common knowledge how to saw someone in half, a lot of magicians would be out of business. Danish-born magician Dante had his own particular way of dealing with spoil sports who tried to reveal his magical secrets. During the, the 30s in America, Camel Cigarettes put out an expose in the newspapers on how tricks were done. Dante was working in New York doing Sawing a Woman in Half at the time. 
And every night he would go on and prove to them that what they saw in the paper was totally incorrect. And the people would go out, would go out of the theater saying, I have no idea how that was done. It was exactly what was exposed in the paper, but he was able to condition them and prove to them it wasn't so. Dante performed the sawing illusion throughout his long career, usually with the help of Australian beauty queen Moyo Miller as his assistant. Do you know, the other day I was wondering how many times I had been sawed in half. So I got my little calculator out and we calculated on a basis of 23 years, one show a night, two shows a night for three years in England, two matinees at least a week. <laughs> and Lord knows how many times we did the four shows and five shows a day during the war years. I came up with 11,800 times. I think that must be pretty near a record. After the Selbit Golden Feud, Dante resolved to never allow his act to be copied or plagiarized. It was a very common procedure for people to come into the theater uh, with their little book and pad and uh, so forth and make uh, sketches of different illusions. This was one reason why Dante would never give his okay to have the show photographed and that's why there is very little on film now of the Dante show. Even though Moyo Miller retired with Dante in the 1950s, she was last sawn in half in 1993 for a special magic performance. Dante always said, Sawing a woman in half is not the problem. Anybody can sew a woman in half. The problem is putting her back together again. The sawing illusion has come a long way since the big wooden box days of Golden and Selbit. The thin model sawing is perhaps the best known example in which the box the girl is contained in appears to be very thin, offering no room for another girl to be involved in the performance or any other method the audience might imagine. In fact, it's one of the most baffling versions of the trick ever invented and elevates the classic illusion to its highest level ever. I believe that magicians have a way of losing track totally of what the idea is behind an illusion that's been around for a long time. And that seems to me what's happened with a sawing in half. Sawing in half is an incredibly brutal idea. And in modern times, about the only other party that I know who's done it with appropriate brutality is the South American magician Ricciardi. He would uh, take one of his female assistants, who I believe was one of his daughters, which makes this even more perverse, uh, and she was dressed in a kind of a hospital gown. And he would lay her on a very thin topped table uh, after apparently uh, putting her under with some sort of anesthetic. He then brought out a huge circular saw, and before the eyes of the audience, ran the circular saw forward, sawing a groove in her right about the hips. Not all the way through, mind you, not a cutesy, oh, let's sever her completely and show the halves, but just a totally, hideously plausible gash about that deep in right about the hips. Now, incidentally, while he's sawing, there's a wonderful mist of blood that flies out over the audience. Quite appalling. Uh, he then invited the audience up onto the stage and take a close look. 
And lo and behold, the next 15 minutes of the show, the audience would come up and almost every single person would want to file past and see what was there. Now, of course, it was an illusion. You know, Ricciardi used to spend much time in abattoirs getting the appropriate interior for this gash. But the audience would come by and gaze in. Simultaneously, two of Ricciardi's assistants would pick up the corpse of the woman, raise her vertically. The front of the gown would fall down in front of her abdomen, and there was an enormous, almost menstrual stain in, in front. It was a god-awful, dreadful sight. And the curtain would come down, and that was the end of the show. Now, there's something to send you home thinking. The public doesn't usually have the loftiest opinion of magicians. And that's because they've often seen very bad ones perform. Uh, they've seen the birthday party magician who screws up his tricks. They've seen the obnoxious stage magician who invites a woman up onto the stage and then makes snide and flirtatious remarks. Uh, they've seen magicians very badly dressed, uh, performing to very bad music, and doing highly insulting things. I mean, when you take a woman and stick her in a box, uh, well, first of all, that's rude. And then when you proceed to, to sever that box into several pieces with a large, vicious saw, well, I'm surprised that there aren't feminists picketing every one of those shows. I think deep down within each and every one of us, there's a kind of a, a shadowed sort of desire to push our own boundaries, our own personal boundaries. Some people have different kind of dark secret desires. Some people desire to be controlled. Others have these kind of um, boundaries that they really want to push. And so when they watch these kind of torturous illusions and, and reenactments, uh, it's a way that they can vicariously live through that. They can have those experiences. It's the same reason why we go on roller coasters and bungee jump and, and, and put ourselves through these, you know, ridiculous experiences that like scare the hell out of us because it's a safe way to go into those places, into those corners of ourselves. Gore on stage, and death for that matter on stage, is a celebration of the fact that we can present the image of death. We can look at the apparent image of death and be perfectly safe and happy. All of that stuff is a celebration of life and it's a celebration of art. And it's done in a beautiful red color. Another time-tested way of defying death on stage is with firearms. From cannons to pistols, all calibers have proved popular with theater and circus audiences. One extremely dangerous stage illusion evolved from the infamous game of Russian roulette. A live bullet is loaded into a revolver. The chamber randomly spun and fired at the head of the magician. In theory, a combination of mechanical and sleight of hand methods prevents any chance of an accident occurring. In theory, that is. British magician Maurice Fogel believed he had eliminated every element of chance in a trick where six rifles were fired at him at point-blank range. Apparently, using telepathy, he removed the rifle that contained the live round. But more than once, the trick went disastrously wrong. For the rest of his life, Fogel carried the scars of near-fatal calamities. 
His worst accident occurred when he was shot between the eyes. Thanks to a talented surgeon, he survived, keeping the pellet as a macabre souvenir. But perhaps the most dangerous gun trick of them all is the infamous bullet catch, in which a magician catches a bullet between his teeth. A marked bullet is loaded into a gun by a member of the public. The danger of the trick lies in the fact that for a large part of the performance, the gun and bullet are out of the hands of the magician. Not until the moment the trigger is pulled does the magician know that the trick has worked. First performed in France in the 16th century, the bullet catch has thrilled audiences all over the world. There have been many variations on the theme, including firing squads and multiple bullets. Some magicians chose to catch the bullets on a plate, others on the tip of a sword. Developments in gun design have changed the look of the trick, with flintlock muskets giving way to bolt-action, high-powered rifles. But the one constant of the trick is the extraordinary amount of nerve required by the magician. Even though you know that you've done everything right, when that stranger you've just met is standing across the room pointing the rifle at you and about to fire the bullet that he has loaded into the gun, it's an unnerving experience and one that I, I would not particularly want to do very often. And with good reason. The bullet catch is said to be the only trick in all of magic that is cursed. Over the years, at least 12 magicians have died and countless others have been badly injured. As a result of mechanical failure, human error, or even overzealous audience participation, unlucky magicians have fallen victim on stage before horrified audiences. This may be the reason why the bullet catch is very rarely performed nowadays, although there are still a few bold magicians who specialize in this particular trick. The many tragedies, accidents and disasters associated with the bullet catch have provided other magicians with a rich source of black humor. My two favorite stories of bad things that happened in the bullet catch are the, the magician who used to do the trick. At one point when the trick was done with muzzle-loading guns, one magician used to do it uh, by the method where you put the ball that's going to fly through the air into the gun and then you ram it in with a ramrod. And the ramrod was so contrived as to sneak the ball right out of the gun. And this fellow thought, well, the, the ramrod's a little bit obvious as a prop. Maybe I'll use my magic wand. And so he had a magic wand that was black ebony with ivory tips. And he had a little ball of wax on the end of one of his ivory tips. So he rammed it into the gun, pulled it out, and sneaked the ball out in his hand, stuck to the, uh, stuck to the wax. He then rammed the other end in, just as a little extra precaution, and didn't happen to notice that the other end of his wand broke off and was there in the gun, and the ivory tip of his wand was fired straight into his face. That's one of my favorite stories about the bullet catch. Uh, my other favorite story is the fellow who was doing it at a Wild West show, and someone just stood up in the audience, and after the, the magician had successfully caught the bullet on stage, said, hey, catch this, and bang, shot him. <laughs> one of the 19th century's greatest exponents of the bullet catch was Signor Antonio Blitz, an Englishman who toured America in the heyday of the Wild West. Blitz can be considered to be one of the luckiest performers of the bullet catch in a time when just about everyone seemed to carry a gun. In New York City, a volunteer spiked Blitz's gun with a handful of carpet tacks. The unsuspecting magician stood his ground as the marksman took aim and fired. Luckily for Blitz, his aim was off. The intended victim left the badly damaged stage with only a lacerated hand. But the most famous bullet-catching magician of all was Chang Ling Su. Due to his tragic death at the height of his fame, his name has become forever synonymous with this hazardous trick.
The tragedy happened when Chung Ling Su performed on stage at the Wood Green Empire in North London. It was the second show on a Saturday night in March 1918, and the theatre was packed with people eager to see the world-famous star. The climax of Su's performance was his version of the bullet catch. In the trick called Condemned to Death by the Boxers, Su was the target of a Chinese firing squad. Two bullets were marked and checked, loaded into the guns and handed to the marksmen. On the fateful night Chung Ling Su was shot, one of the gunmen was 17-year-old Jack Grossman. Quite a lot of people went out of the theatre and really didn't know what had happened. They didn't realise he'd been shot and killed. They thought it was the end of the performance and quite a queer way of ending it. The audience thought it was all part of the act. But as he went down, Sue apparently called, oh my God, something's wrong. The stage manager then rang down the curtain. They then saw there was blood pouring from his chest. The bullet went right through him. He was wrapped in a curtain they found off stage and then as quickly as possible taken to the local hospital. We were removed from the stage after half an hour with my uh, close assistant who was also firing a gun at him and taken to the police station and kept there all night. And we were only released in the early morning when we were told that Chang Su had died and they didn't need it anymore. The police concentrated on the circumstances of the tragedy and especially on the rifles. As news of the star magician's death spread all over the world, a government firearms expert was called in to examine the weapons. Chang Ling Su looked after those two guns himself. He wouldn't let anybody else handle them. He kept them in his dressing room, he, he prepared them, and only released them on stage to his Japanese stage manager. During the official inquiry, the firearms expert Robert Churchill had quickly discovered the reason why Sue had been so secretive about the guns. They had in fact been altered. The entry to the barrel, where the percussion cap would normally fire the charge, had been sealed off, and a channel had been bored into the ramrod tube below. When you pull the trigger, instead of firing the charge in the barrel, you fired a charge in the ramrod tube. And unbeknown to anyone, Sue had put a blank charge in the ramrod tube. So that, in essence, what happened was the bullet was never fired and Sue produced a duplicate. At the end of every performance, Sue would secretly remove the marked bullet which was still in the barrel. Churchill discovered that he had used the unorthodox method of unscrewing the breech of the gun rather than extracting the lead bullet with a corkscrew attached to the ramrod. This avoided damage to the marked bullet, but these repeated unscrewings of the breech led to considerable wear of the screw threads. After 12 years of continual performance, the whole assembly was extremely loose. Another problem was that Sue favoured a very fine grain gunpowder. Had he used a coarser grain, then the tragedy might never have happened. The fine grain trickled through the worn screw thread into the barrel itself. So, on that ill-fated night, one gun actually fired its bullet. But the question that still haunts many today is which one of the two assistants actually fired the bullet that killed Chung Ling Su. Dan Crowley, the second gunman, remembered at the time that his rifle seemed to have a greater kick than usual, which of course would happen if a bullet was actually fired from his gun. Jack Grossman noticed nothing unusual. After getting the report from the gunsmith, they brought in a death, his death was brought on by a misadventure. In the course of the inquiry, all of Sue's bullet-catching secrets were revealed in the newspapers but the public soon learned his biggest secret of all. Everyone assumed that Su was Chinese. Off stage, when he met reporters, he would talk gobbledygook to them, which his Japanese assistant would then obligingly translate into broken English. Su seemed to be the epitome of a Chinese magician. On the Monday morning, when the news broke in the papers that Chung Ling Su had been shot and fatally wounded, 
And it went on to say that Sue was, in fact, an American, William Ellsworth Robinson, born in New York City. This was quite a shock of a second nature. Here, their hero had been shot. Secondly, he wasn't the man they thought he was. Robinson had learned his trade working with many great magicians of the 19th century. He invented a few minor illusions, but achieved little personal success as a performer. Seeing the popularity of other Eastern magicians, some real, others bogus, Robinson decided to exploit the public appetite for all things Oriental. He assumed the identity of the mysterious Chinese conjurer, Chung Ling Su, and his career took off. One of the sad features of Su's death was that there began to appear in newspapers and books speculation as to whether he'd been murdered or whether he'd committed suicide. All his assistants said they had no idea how the trick worked. If they had no idea how it worked, there is no conceivable way in which they could have jinxed it in order to effect a murder, whatever one might wish to dream up of marital problems or other reasons for this. Certainly, I wouldn't think there was any possibility of a murder, but suicide is a very clear possibility. He might have decided to end his life in a very dramatic way, and in his contract, he had to wear a bulletproof waistcoat. But that night at Wood Green Empire, he didn't wear it. And also, during the week, he used to travel with us from Wood Green Station, underground, home, and he really opened up to us and started talking to his advance manager was with us and the two Chinese boys. And he was relating how unhappy he was and that he was far happier as a young man earning five pound a week than he was earning 500 pound a week, which was rather surprising that he should speak that way to us. And this was during that week and on the Saturday night he was killed. For suicide, the evidence of Robert Churchill points to a chance occasion, a chance effect, due to the cumulative effect of manipulations on the rifle, simply to remove the bullets after each show. If Sue had wished to commit suicide, in my opinion, he would have gone about it in a foolproof way, not in one which depended upon the elements of chance. <laughs> When the news of Sue's death reached his rival Houdini, the escape artist announced that he would perform the bullet catch. But Houdini's mentor and teacher, Harry Keller, urged his protege not to try it, claiming it was too dangerous and left too much to chance. Don't try the damn bullet trick. We can't afford to lose Houdini. You owe it to your friends and to your family to cut out all the stuff that entails risk of your life. Houdini took his advice and never performed the bullet catch. By the 1930s, magician Ted Anneman took the bullet catch to a new level of realism. He performed outdoors in daylight with highly skilled police marksmen. He was a very moody and troubled person who had an unfortunate and sad life but he was a very creative innovator in magic, particularly mentalism. The significance of Ted Anneman's version of the bullet catching trick is that it was one of the most closely guarded secrets in magic in the 20th century. This extremely rare piece of film of Anneman's performance can only hint at the level of drama he brought to the trick.
Although Annaman performed the bullet catch only four times in his career, his is still considered one of the most dramatic presentations of the trick ever witnessed. Even today, over 50 years after his death, the exact method he used remains a mystery. As time went by, magicians made changes and improvements to the technical side of the bullet catch trick. Often a glass or plastic screen between the gun and the magician proved that a projectile had really been fired. I have, we'll have a sheet of glass. I'll put the glass between you and that bulletproof backstop. Right about here. All right. Now that's held up at the level of my head. Yes. Now, I'm sure that your marksmanship at this close range is perfectly adequate. However, as a minimum of precaution, I would like to wear a bulletproof vest. All right, very quickly put it on, please, so that we can get to this act. And to protect my eyes, some goggles. Now, I will be holding this handkerchief. When I drop the handkerchief, that will be your signal to fire. To fire. Aim very carefully through this sheet of glass, and your target will be my mouth. Your mouth. I will attempt to catch the bullet in my mouth using my tongue to cushion the impact. Are you ready? I am ready. All right, would you remove the safety catch, please? I have removed the safety catch. All right, I'm going to stand right about here. Please do not fire until I drop the handkerchief. It's a hair trigger, so don't try to take up any slack in the trigger. All right, here we go. Wait a minute. He's all right. Good God. That is a horrible sensation. Are you all right? And there is the bullet. Let me check the bullet to see. My initial G on the end of the bullet. Good. That is a horrible you experience. You may keep that for a, a souvenir. Horrible experience. Would you open the gun, please? I will open the gun. I'm so nervous I can hardly get it open. Meticulous attention to safety has allowed professional bullet catcher Dorothy Dietrich to perform the trick on an almost daily basis without mishap. Part of the show is not a sketch. It's based on an old sideshow trick with a very bad reputation. It uses bullets. Twelve people have died attempting this trick, and they were only using one bullet. Penn and Teller are using two. One for Penn and one for Teller. Thank you, Carrie. We're going to move a bullet from this side of the stage to that side of the stage and another bullet from that side of the stage to this side of the stage without crossing that line. We don't really do many things for the sake of shocking. Though we do use a lot of sharp instruments and we do use blood and we do use weapons. We, we use these all because there's, they, cre they, they create dramatic situations. When you see a magic act very often, there's nothing even remotely dramatic about it. I mean, what's dramatic about somebody pulling out one pigeon after another, or pulling out little silk handkerchiefs and tying knots in there? There's nothing like, you wouldn't find that in a movie. In, you know, in a movie, you would find the villain pursuing the hero uh, through, through uh, dangerous straits with a large gun. There, there has to be danger for there to be drama. And we're gonna do it using these magic wands. These are 357 Magnum Colt Python magic wands. Concealing our safety was what allows the audience to feel the drama of the whole business. And we have actually operating during that particular piece three independent safety systems, any two of which could conceivably fail and we would still be absolutely safe. So although I hope your heart still pounds when you watch it, know that we will not die. But some would say that it took magicians Penn and Teller to take this 400-year-old trick into the next century. Ladies and gentlemen, Penn and Teller's 
magic bullet. We perform lots of things that look very dangerous. We do not perform dangerous tricks. Dangerous tricks are performed by fools. Cameras walk away. The modern audience's hunger for danger seems utterly endless. Thanks to safety devices and advances in technology, it is an appetite that some talented magicians can satisfy and still survive. Watch your ears, please.